I guess uh, all biology teachers, and I include myself, and I assume everyone in this audience is also one, uh, is motivated uh, to teach biology in part um, with the idea or the sort of the philosophical tenet that we would like our students to appreciate the connectedness of humans and the rest of the living world. The fact that there are molecules in us that are in other living things, that there are cells in us that are not very different from the cells in other living things, and that there are organ systems in us that are also in some ways similar to those in other living things. And I think uh, generally this idea of connectedness is a, a powerful impetus for students to get interested in biology, to see that the world is made up of things just like themselves. There is one problem with this approach, and that is that human beings are very different from all the other animals on this planet in one very special way, and that is we have overcome many of the things that we teach in biology, uh, and I'll give you a few examples. One is that uh, our biological system that has evolved on this planet over a billion years of living things uh, has never left the planet until just recently when human beings planted flags on the moon and sent their first robot scouts to Mars. This is a pretty big step for living things on this planet. It's happened during our own lifetimes, which is quite remarkable. The other uh, important uh, change for living things is that uh, Darwinian natural selection is the mode most of us are allowed to teach, uh, the way in which uh, animals come to be. And although uh, I think most of us would agree that this is a fundamental principle of biology, there is a kind of intelligent design going on right now, and I'm not talking about God, but human beings that are uh, making animals um, for their own uses. Uh, animals that have, for example, fluorescent proteins and nerve cells. Animals that have particular genes knocked out or genes added in that, they, that don't belong there. The fluorescent proteins can come from jellyfish. And they end up in mice. This is a, a kind of weird thing, and it's never happened before, as far as I know. Uh, and it's happening now, just during our lifetimes. These tenets of life being localized to this planet, the tenet that all life forms are developed strictly by natural selection, both of these ideas are in question largely because of us. It's us that have changed the rules of the game, and it's happening right now. And this is a problem, because aren't we just the same as all these other animals? Why are, why are these things so different? Why are things so different for us? What are we doing? What makes us different? I think if you look at our kidneys, uh, I don't know this for a fact, but my guess is that the human kidney and the elephant kidney and the lion kidney and the monkey kidney and the rat kidney are all pretty much the same. You're not going to find any insights into why human beings are able to overcome a billion years of life history to do things that other animals have never done before in our kidneys, and you won't find it in our lungs or our livers, our heart. You'll certainly find it, however, I think everyone would agree, in our nervous systems. There's something about our nervous systems that make human beings different from all these other animals. And this is a deeply disturbing question for a biologist because it's not immediately obvious why our nervous systems are different. We are still made out of genetic code. We come from basically the same building blocks all the other animals come from. What is different about our brains? And most of you probably appreciate the fact that human brains are large relative to the size of our bodies. But we, by far, don't have the biggest brains on the planet. Uh, elephants and whales and many other uh, large bovine animals have bigger brains, but they have more body mass, and uh, this might mean that the fact that we're scrawny is the reason we're so special. I don't think most of us would take that as a reasonable reason. Um, maybe we just have more nerve cells packed in denser. That's certainly not the case. If anything, our nerve cells are a little farther apart than other animals. 
If you look in the light microscope at our brain and look at individual nerve cells, they don't look any different from other animals. In fact, it's very hard to find evidence at the light microscopic level that human brains are in any way different from the brains of other mammals. You might go to the electron microscope and look at synaptic connections at high resolution. Again, you're not going to find, as far as I know, no one has seen anything that would suggest there's something special about our brains. And yet, it's unambiguous, I think, that it's our nervous systems, our intelligence, our cultural evolution that has made us do these things that other animals haven't done. So this is a fundamental question for biologists, and I think for biology teachers, it's not an unreasonable question to pose, you know, what is it that makes humans special? Um, even though we also try to point out what makes us the same as other animals. And um, I would say the answer is not entirely clear, but one approach uh, to this question might be to ask, well, maybe it has something to do with the way our brains develop. Uh, could we, we have a very long gestation compared to other animals? Is, is it possible, for example, that humans uh, come into the world just knowing a lot more than other animals? So we have a sort of head start uh, when it comes to intelligence. And when every one of you I know has experienced human babies, you've all been babies, of course you don't remember that. And that, the reason you don't remember being a baby is the basic fact that human babies are severely disabled, neurologically speaking. Rather than coming into the world knowing how to do a lot of things, human babies are almost uniquely poorly adapted to do anything. They are more helpless, actually, than almost any other baby we know of. A human baby can't turn over, as you all know. A human baby takes about a year to figure out how to walk. That's a ridiculously long time to figure out how to walk. Other animals have no trouble walking quickly. Some animals have to run away from their parents who will eat them if they don't run away. Baby snakes, for example, have to run away, baby fish. Uh, so what is going on here? Why, if we're so special later on, and we come into the world with nothing, and we seem to be so poor, why does this all work out? There was a famous philosopher, John Locke, who at the beginning of the Enlightenment in 1690 claimed that the essence of human humanity was the fact that we come into the world as a tabula rasa, a blank slate, that unlike other animals, we know nothing. And that is a big advantage because it allows our experiences to mold into us a particular set of behaviors that we would not have otherwise. And that gives us a kind of plasticity. And this seems like a very reasonable idea. When you look at a newborn baby, you get the impression they don't know a great deal. Uh, and maybe that is underlying this. But as a neurobiologist, what does a blank slate mean? And I would just say that uh, this is the basic research question uh, my colleagues and I have been studying since I was a graduate student. I began asking these questions about what happens to the nervous system between this early period when the nervous system seems so poorly uh, functioning and later on. And the big shock, the real surprise, is that John Locke got it completely wrong, as far as we can tell. I mean, not that he was just a little wrong, it was sort of opposite. Uh, we don't come into the world, as far as I can tell, with a blank slate, a chalkboard with no chalk on it, upon which we build the circuitry of a brain. We come into the world with a blackboard filled with chalk. There's chalk everywhere. Every possible connection you could imagine is there and some, and then over the course of experience, over the course of life, we gradually lose connections until we become mature, which is when you reach middle age, age of 52. <laughs> so this is kind of surprising. And in a way, there's good news and bad news about this. The good news is that babies come into the world maybe with every possible set of connections for every possible experience that they may or may not have. And then based on what they actually experience, they make a nervous system that is perfectly tuned for that set of experiences. And that's why students can learn so many things. The bad news is that after you reach middle age, a lot of those connections are gone completely, 
gone, and you have more or less decided the way the world should be. <clears throat> and uh, when new ideas come along, like when my children tell me things uh, almost every day, I just can't quite see them for being valuable. I just don't, they go in one ear and out the other. They don't resonate anymore. I just, there's something about the way they see the world that's different from the way I see the world. I know the way I see it is right and the way they see it's wrong, but for some reason I can't convince them. And I have a feeling that this is part of what growing up is about. It's becoming what we would call as middle-aged adults wise and what my children would call stupid in the sense that we can only see the world in a particular way. In my view, what education is about is making uh, the connections that you think are important to be maintained and eliminating the ideas that are inappropriate and wrong. And that, that what we're doing as teachers is actually molding our students neurologically, literally uh, changing the connections in their brains. And once we make that imprint, uh, they're stuck with what we say. So we better get it right. <laughs> so I'd like today uh, just to show you some evidence for this idea. I think uh, many of you may have heard my colleague Josh Sains. Did he speak last time? Yeah. So he told you about these mice that are fluorescent. And I want to show you a little more about what we do with those mice. Uh, these mice, uh, as I mentioned and as I'm sure he mentioned, are basically uh, a weird product of a genetic a piece of code from jellyfish that causes a bioluminescent jellyfish, Aquaria victoria, to fluoresce. And these animals' gene has been implanted now into the nervous system of mammals uh, by using a couple genetic tricks. And I'm not going to talk about the genetic tricks. I think he probably went into that some and rather go into the neurobiology that we can do with these mice. Uh, some of the pictures I'm going to show are the same. They're pictures that he borrowed from me, so I, I, unfortunately there's not much I can do. I have to show the same pictures, but uh, I will try to get to, new, to things that he didn't talk about reasonably quickly. Uh, the aim of putting a fluorescent protein inside a mouse, which may seem uh, kind of odd, is that it lets us see what's going on. You know, uh, the reason we want to see it is, is already a very interesting neurobiological fact. We take it for granted that you want to see what I'm going to show you. This is maybe more related to the fact that human beings are visual animals than the fact that there is any real extra truth to a visual image of a biological phenomenon than any other kind of way of talking about it. For example, if we were bats, we would almost certainly send echoes out there to convey an idea. If we were mice, maybe there'd be odor maps in this room. I'd be puffing little smells around to convey an idea. But for human beings, vision is a very powerful way to understand things. But all the things I'm going to show you are normally invisible. That is, the cells don't have any color in them. And this is only an abstraction to allow us to understand what's going on. So we have focused on the connections in the nervous system of developing animals, and we focused a lot of our work um, on the connections that are easiest to see, which are ones where in a living animal, we can come back time and time again to the very same connections between nerve cells and target cells. And, and much of this work, and the work I'm going to talk about today especially, is done at the connection between nerve cells and muscle fibers. These are neuromuscular junctions. And uh, we've been working in a muscle called the sternomastoid muscle, which is uh, this, it, well, if I had a longer normal sized neck and I didn't have so much fat, uh, it would be right here. Uh, I'm sure many of you have this, you all have this muscle. Many of you, it shows up in me. It's not so easy to see. It, it's a muscle that runs from the sternum to the mastoid process. That's why it's called sternomastoid. And uh, it's a very big muscle and that's why we like it to use because if we make an anesthetized mouse a midline incision and we pull the salivary glands laterally, we can expose this muscle and then we can just put the mouse, we, this is an animal that's under respiration, he has an endotracheal tube in, it's on a respirator, he's anesthetized, and we put this mouse on the stage of a microscope uh, and then we use a special kind of microscope objective that uses water immersion, so we just fill this wound with saline, 
and then we can just image these neuromuscular junctions, especially if they're fluorescent. Uh, and if they're fluorescent, they're fluorescent because they have the jellyfish fluorescent protein in them. Uh, a few other things to say just about doing uh, work like this. It's not very gory work because if you make a midline incision, uh, there's almost no blood because very few blood vessels cross the midline. So as long as you aim right down the center here, uh, you can expose this muscle uh, in a kind of bloodless way. And this is uh, what you see. There is that muscle right there, the sternomastoid muscle. So we, we just put a microscope objective over this area, and then we use something called epifluorescence microscopy. I know most of the microscopes you're used to, I'm sure, are ones where the light comes in from the bottom, and the slide is sitting here, and you look from the top. These are microscopes where the light comes in through the objective, it excites the fluorescent dye in the specimen, and then through a filter, you only see the fluorescence back up at your eyes or in the camera. The um, light coming in is one color and the fluorescence is another color, so you can filter out the fluorescence. So that's the way these microscopes work. And if we look in that little region, and Josh may have shown you this picture before. Oh, I've, that's the other issue I forgot to mention. These animals are alive and they're moving around. <laughs> and this is a big, big problem. Uh, so getting good pictures is a big problem in these animals. Uh, let's see here. Um, but this is what that region looks like. Did he show you this picture? Have you already seen it? No, you don't remember that. Okay, so this is, a, this is the nerve branch uh, that comes into that little region of the muscle. And this big tree-shaped object is the branches of all the neurons' axons, which are the processes that go out to muscle fibers. And each of them ends in these little red dollops here. And the red is a different uh, probe. The yellow is the yellow fluorescent protein from the jellyfish that's inside these mice. And the red color uh, is actually the staining of the receptors on the muscle fiber membrane that respond to the neurotransmitter, which is acetylcholine, that comes out of the nerve and binds to those receptors. Uh, the receptors are stained with a fluorescent tag of bungarotoxin. Bungaris multisynctus is a snake, a crate, uh, sort of like a mamba. It's a, a venomous snake that is, uh, kills its prey by um, putting out this bungarotoxin, which binds to the acetylcholine receptors. And as the animal tries to run away, uh, the acetylcholine doesn't get to the muscle fibers, so the animal slows down and it stops breathing, and it makes it easy for the crate to eat um, the prey. And by putting a little red fluorescent tag on the bungarotoxin, then you can label all these little neuromuscular junctions. And each muscle fiber has one of these junctions. The fibers are running like this. The muscle's thick, and this is a collapsed view of the entire thickness of the muscle. We can go to higher power and use a kind of microscope called a laser scanning confocal microscope. Is this something? Have you heard about confocal microscopy before? This, this is really one of those great tools that makes imaging a, a pleasure. It gives you very thin optical sections of three-dimensional structures so that although you don't have to section the t material, you can focus into a particular depth in a three-dimensional object and get only the light coming back from that particular plane. The out-of-focus light from the areas above and below are rejected by the confocal microscope's optics. And then if you image one depth after another, and then add all the data together, you can get a reconstruction of a little area like this with nothing out of focus. So here is that little region. And you can see, although this is, it looks flat, it actually is a three-dimensional object. And I could show it to you as a three-dimensional object, although I haven't here. It's just flattened down, but there's nothing out of focus, because all the out of focus light has been rejected by the optics and the confocal. So here now at higher power, you see this little bundle of axons. And each of these is the connection between a nerve and a muscle fiber. And the red color is the acetylcholine receptors that have been labeled with bungarotoxin. And the yellow is the axons coming in. And I think what I really want you to notice here is that each of these neuromuscular junctions is contacted by exactly one axon. This doesn't mean that one neuron only contacts one muscle fiber. One neuron might 
branch to several different muscle fibers, but each muscle fiber only has one junction on its length, and it's only contacted by one axon. That's the main point, and you'll see why that is significant in a, in a moment. Let me just go to higher power. If we kill the animal and stain the muscle fibers with phylloidin, so you can see the sarcomeres and the individual muscle fibers. So here are two muscle fibers. And then by using the red fluorescence of the red tagged Bhungra toxin, you can see the receptors on the surface of each muscle fiber. Each muscle fiber has its own distinct pattern. Uh, and it's just a random pattern. They're in every, every neuromuscular junction looks a little different from every other one. There's nothing special about this pattern. It's just this is the way they look. And then this is the overlying nerve terminal. Yep. A very nice co-localization of the nerve exactly over the receptor sites. Just remarkable collinearity. It raises many developmental questions of how does the muscle get the receptors exactly under where the nerve is releasing acetylcholine. And despite the fact that you might think this would be an easy question to answer, it's still not so clear uh, whether, for example, the nerve grows in and finds the receptor sites or the nerve grows in and induces receptors. But somehow there's a beautiful coordination so that the presynaptic and the postsynaptic side of the synapse perfectly co-aligned. And again, this is in a, an adult animal, and you see that each neuromuscular junction is contacted by exactly one axon. If we do this same kind of picture um, in development, we see another uh, thing altogether. And I'm going to show you that in one moment. But before showing you that, I just want to give you a sense of what you can do with animals like this. If one crushes this nerve, just takes a forceps, and just squeezes the nerve right here, all the distal branches of all these axons will degenerate. But because this is in the peripheral nervous system, where nerves can regenerate, these axons will grow back and refine their old neuromuscular junction sites and make synapses again. And we can now, because these animals are stained like this in life, we can make a movie of watching a nerve grow back to a single neuromuscular junction. So let me just show you what a movie like that looks like. So this is about four hours. And what you're seeing is a nerve growing up along the old receptor site, recapitulating the former branching pattern that was there a few days earlier before the nerve was damaged. There's a green stain in here that is not shown very clearly. That is the glial cells that are stained. Uh, but I, I'm not going to talk much about them in this picture. I'll show you a little later some better pictures of the glial cells. But it's very interesting to watch these nerves. They clearly have some idea where the receptors are. Notice how perfectly they just follow along the old receptor sites. Anyway, that's the kind of thing that we could, you know, we've always wanted to be able to see nerve regeneration in living animals. We now can do this in the periphery, and we can tr do it in the spinal cord, although when we cut nerves in the spinal cord, they don't grow. They just die back. Uh, but that these techniques are now making it possible to study phenomena like nerve regrowth in living animals. So let's get back to the question of development. So what does it look like during the period of the blank slate, or as I would say, the white slate, the tabula rasa period, when animals are not yet using their nervous system very well? What about neuromuscular junctions? Are they innervated the same way they are as adults, or are they innervated in a different way? And so here is a neuromuscular junction from a one-week-old mouse in a living animal. We've shined light in from the side just to show the muscle fibers. And then in addition, the fluorescence is showing the nerve and the receptor site. And now, rather than having one of those big pretzels, there's this little kind of plaque-shaped receptor area, which is much smaller. The adult neuromuscular junction would be about this big. So this is about a third the length of the adult one, and maybe half as wide. And the other thing is, it's no longer innervated by only one input. There's more than one axon going to this neuromuscular junction. This is at postnatal day seven in a mouse, and about half the neuromuscular junctions at postnatal day seven have more than one input, have two inputs. The other half have only one input. But if we go back even earlier in life, like postnatal day one or two, then every single neuromuscular junction has more than one input. But frankly, you can't tell how many because they're so bundled in together, it's hard to count them. So there's at least two 
at postnatal day seven on many of them, and earlier all of them have more than two probably, and I'll give you a hint about how much more in a second. So where are these extra inputs coming from? So, you know, where, where is this extra stuff coming from and where does it go? Why does it disappear? So there are three basic possibilities here for where that extra input could come from. One possibility is that in early development, there are nerve cells that are alive that undergo a, a phenomenon known as naturally occurring cell death. I don't know if this is something you're familiar with, but... Okay, that's right. So there is a whole period of time in development when lots of neurons die. So is it possible that these neuromuscular junctions that are temporarily innervated by more than one input have inputs from neurons that ultimately succumb? And that when we see this extra innervation, we're talking about neurons that actually die. So that's one possibility. Second possibility is that neurons target their axon to particular muscles, but maybe in development occasionally they make a mistake. They go to their appropriate muscle, but also send collaterals to the wrong muscle. And so that these connections that are present early are errors of projection, and they get eliminated as the neuron maintains connections with its appropriate muscle and gets rid of connections with the wrong one. The third possibility is that, in fact, uh, the connections that are being eliminated are not really very different from the connections that are being maintained. They just happen to be the fact that nerve cells early on make many more connections than they ultimately do. And then during a period of development, each neuromuscular junction ends up with only one input due to the loss, perhaps through competition between these inputs for the same synaptic site, of all but one of the inputs to each of these. Anyone have a guess as to which of these is this? Is it A, B, or C? It is C. It turns out it's C. And, and the evidence for it, the way we, we know the evidence for it, is by saying that if it were C, then if you looked at a single nerve cell and all of its connections, Early on, a nerve cell might be connected to many more muscle fibers than that nerve cell is connected to later. Whereas if it's A or B, the nerve cells that are not being lost would have the same number of connections early and late. So what we do is we go back to early development in a line of mice where rather than all the axons expressing a yellow fluorescent protein, we have a line of mice where through what's called position effect variegation, only a very small number of neurons express fluorescent protein, and in those mice we can actually see all the branches of a single axon. So let me show you one of those mice just after the period of loss is over, when an animal is two weeks of age. This is a muscle I'm going to show you now where only one axon is labeled with fluorescent protein. This is postnatal day 13 in the clidomastoid muscle, which is right next to the sternomastoid, another muscle we can get at in living animals. And here we have each of these is one of those receptor sites, but now rather than having all the axons labeled, we have exactly one axon in this entire muscle that's expressing the fluorescent protein, and each of these is its terminals. And because it's only one axon, it's actually quite easy to count all the branches that axon has. And this axon innervates 4% of the muscle fibers, 18 of the 425 muscle fibers in this muscle are innervated by this one axon. And the connections it makes are spread out kind of in a sparse way. If we look at higher power at one little region, you can see that the axon comes in and the few muscle fibers it connects to, it covers all the receptors on them. This is the one and only axon there. All the receptors on each of those sites is occupied by this axon. But there are lots of other muscle fibers that are innervated by other axons that are not fluorescent, so we don't see them. So now we can just do the same thing earlier, like just before birth. Look at a single axon in this muscle and look at what a typical axon does. So here is embryonic day 18, just the day before birth in these mice. Single axon, same muscle, the clidomastoid. And let me show you how many connections it makes. This axon innervates 80%, 331 of the 422 neuromuscular junctions in this muscle. This number, 422, is just the same, one different from the number we saw later in age. So the number of muscle fibers hasn't changed. But this axon is now branching to many, many, many more muscle fibers. In fact, 
uh, 16-fold more muscle fibers early on than later. Now, if every axon made all these extra connections, but the number of muscle fibers is the same, then each of these sites must be shared by many, many different axons. So if we look at high power, maybe we would now expect that the axon would not occupy all the receptors, but only small regions in there. And indeed, when we look at high power, and this is again using a confocal microscope to flatten everything, we see that the neuromuscular junctions now are only weakly innervated by these axons. They make small connections in them. So there's plenty of room for the other 15 or so axons that crowd in to each of these neuromuscular junctions. So at birth, every single axon makes many, many weak connections. It tries out many, many possibilities. And then it's sort of like a dilettante, you know, doing many things poorly. And then later on, it pulls back all but a few connections to strongly and excellently do a subset of things. And this is really a metaphor for us as well. I think we start out trying many things, do them all pretty poorly. We find a few things we do well, and that's what we're stuck doing the rest of our lives. And this is basically what's happening to our nerve cells, and we are just an embodiment of our brains. After all, we are just made up of nerve cells, so maybe that's not so surprising. So here is the idea that you start out with many connections, and then you end up with few. So then the next question you can ask is, well, how do these branches that were present on a neuromuscular junction disappear? Is that clear so far? I'd certainly interrupt me if, is, is it, if you've got it, what I'm saying, okay. So the next question is, how do these branches disappear? A lot of them disappear. 95% of the branches disappear. And, and I should say, if this is happening in a mouse, it's certainly happening in us as well. And this is happening even in muscle, you know, a part of the nervous system that normally we don't think of as being very interesting in terms of malleability, and it's undergoing this massive change. So how do these connections disappear? Uh, one way to look at that is to do a time lapse of a single neuromuscular junction and watch the transition from multiple to single innervation. I'm gonna show you a time lapse movie. Unfortunately, it only has three frames. Each frame was taken on a separate day of the same neuromuscular junction, watching it undergo loss of one of the connections. So this is a neuromuscular junction in a postnatal day seven mouse. And right next to it is another neuromuscular junction on the adjacent muscle fiber. Again, the red is the acetylcholine receptors and the yellow is the yellow fluorescent protein. This neuromuscular junction is contacted by two axons. And this neuromuscular junction is contacted by one. So it has already lost all but one axon. But this one still has more than one axon. And in fact, this branch here is a sibling branch of the axon that goes here. This axon comes in, they go out of focus at this point, the confocal cuts off the out of focus light, so they will cut, but they're just going out of focus. So this junction is innervated by the same axon that innervates this junction, and then a second axon comes in and innervates this junction as well. So that's postnatal day seven. And then after taking this picture, we sewed up the wound, allowed the baby mouse to recover, went back to its mother, and then a day later, we re-anesthetized the animal, we made, uh, opened up the incision in the neck, re-exposed the muscle, found the same two muscle fibers, and took another picture at postnatal day eight. And then we come back and take another picture at postnatal day nine. So here's the picture at postnatal day eight. And at first sight, you may say, hmm, not much changed. But something did change. I don't know, can you see what changed? Anybody want to hazard a guess about what has changed? The line is thinner. Is it this line? Yeah. <laughs> Quite right, and it's atrophic. That's what we call it. it. It sounds a little more scientific than say thinner, but it means thinner, absolutely. So it just got thinner, and it got thinner all the way back to the branch point uh, quite quickly. You know, this is only 24 hours later. It has a couple of varicosities in it, but this branch is thinner. And then postnatal day nine, it's gone, but not completely forgotten in the sense that there's this thing, which is a sort of bulbed end of what is the perhaps retracting axon. And I put it in quotes because this doesn't tell you it retracted. It could be that it degenerated and the 
wound end is a swollen bulb, so it doesn't tell you how it got here. But this is basically the way a single branch disappears. And uh, to get a better sense of what is going on, how this branch disappears, we've made time-lapse movies of this process, of the process of what's going on from this step on. And this is one of those movies. This is, again, a several-hour time-lapse. So now not days, but just hours. So the neuromuscular junction is down here. And at first sight, um, it looks like a process is retracting back into this bulb. Uh, if you look at this a while, what we just began to appreciate is that stuff is left behind. See these little pieces? And in fact, we now know from electron microscopy that a lot of the material that the axon uh, gives up here, it's not that it's being dragged back, but actually it's shedding out these little pieces of cytoplasm that get taken up by the glial cells that are surrounding. And I'll give you some evidence for that in a second. Some people ask me, why does it keep trying again and again? And I just want to tell you this is a looped movie, of course. <laughs> so one way to get a better picture of what's going on here is to do serial electron microscopy. Is this something you've heard about? This is where you use a transmission electron microscope to take image after image after image, and then you put them together to make a three-dimensional image based on electron microscopy. Let me just show you an example of one of these retracting axons that we have photoconverted. We've made it dark. This is it in cross-section here before we get to the bulb area. And then I'm going to play through this movie, which is a bunch of electron micrographs at very high resolution of this bulb. It takes a little while to get used to looking at serial electron microscopy. What we're doing is focusing in and out of an object by simply taking all the electron micrographs and lining them up. And this bulb-shaped object is the bulbous end of an axon that comes in here that has recently been eliminated from a muscle fiber. The entire bulb is sitting inside another cell type, which is the glial cell. This is the nucleus of the glial cell. It's called a Schwann cell, and this is its cytoplasm here. And the entire bulb is enveloped in the cytoplasm of the glial cell. And the bulb itself is filled with little vesicles, 40 nanometer vesicles, and mitochondria. Those bigger things are mitochondria. And right next to the bulb, as you'll see when we come back the other way, is another vesicle-filled profile that has no dye in it right here. Pretty subtle to see. But that is one of the shed pieces of this axon that is now completely separated from the axon itself. The glial cell is just eating up little pieces of the axon. I'm going to just show you two pictures from this at higher power. So here is the three-dimensional reconstruction of that bulb. And here are two electron micrographs from that movie. One shows that little detached remnant, which are those little pieces that get shed as the axon pulls back. And here is a, a finger of the glial cell that is invading this bulb and looks like it's in the process of pinching it off. So this is probably how these bulbs form. The reason this one is not dark is that this was labeled with a membrane dye that filled the process. But if this is no longer connected, uh, none of the dye will pass over there. So that's why this is clear and this is dark. So we call that axosome shedding. These are axosomes. I mean, we named them axosomes. But that, that's basically what that shows. I want to show you. Um, here's just another example of one of these uh, with little axosomes. Here's another one of those little axosomes around a bulb, completely enveloped in a glial cell. And here's one more movie of the retraction process. In this case, the retracting axon is blue, and the remaining axon at a neuromuscular junction is green. And you can see there's just a lot of dynamism to this retraction process. One of the nice things about using these mice is that we don't have to be very smart and clever in terms of experiments. All we have to do is watch. And I know a lot of uh, science education is about teaching students how to generate a hypothesis and testing a hypothesis. There is that other kind of science, the inductive approach, where you get the hypothesis at the end, not at the beginning. This work is very much along those lines, where we have tools that let us see clearly, and we generate ideas based on what we see, not that we start with an idea and test it. And this is a you know, big controversy in, in neurobiology, whether there really is any 
point to doing this kind of descriptive biology. For us, it, it's worked quite well. We've learned a good deal doing that. In fact, one of the things we can do now is make a mouse that rather than show this process from the perspective of the nerve cell, we can see the whole process from the perspective of the glial cells by making a mouse where the glial cell expresses fluorescent protein and the nerve cell doesn't. So let me just show you a quick picture of that. This is a neuromuscular junction where now the nerves are dark. They're not fluorescent. This is the retracting axon. This is the one that's staying. And now we can make a movie watching the retraction process from the perspective of the cells that are surrounding the nerve that is going back. And you can see that all of this retraction is taking place inside the glial cells. The other interesting thing we see when we look at these is that the glial cells nuclei are rotating. I, you know, this is not something I've seen in textbooks that nuclei rotate, but apparently they do. You can see this glial cell's nucleus rotate here. Also, you can see that this glial cell's nucleus is wrapping around this axon. And myelination, the coding uh, long axons, are presumably due to glial cells wrapping. Why a glial cell would be wrapping around an axon that's disappearing is not so clear. Maybe it's unwrapping uh, the glial sheath around this cell. Once the axon's gone, what happens to these glial cells that are no longer have an axon to deal with when one is left? Well, when we've started to make movies like this, the glial cells that are no longer are orphaned because their uh, patron nerve has withdrawn, they try to go away and they start growing, whereas the glial cells associated with the other nerve are happy at the neuromuscular junction. The glial cells that have lost a connection because the axon is pulled back then undergo a change in their phenotype and start branching wildly trying to find another place. This glial cell is going to go underneath this muscle fiber, see, trying to find a place to go. So very interesting kind of cell biology to watch this stuff in living animals. Um, and we worked a good deal at trying to understand these details. I'm going to just show you one other uh, example, I'll skip that, of the fact that we could also look at this process from the perspective of the organelles inside axons. This is a mouse we've made where only the mitochondria in the nerves express fluorescent protein. In this case, a cyan blue colored fluorescent protein only in the mitochondria of the nerves. And then we can watch synapse loss in these mice, and I'm not going to show you much about that. I just want to show you the cell biology of looking at a nerve, two axons in a mouse where only the mitochondria are labeled. And the mitochondria are moving like crazy uh, in these nerves. This is a single axon. This is a node of Ranvier. This, the myelin is here and here. And the, uh, the mitochondria are moving back and forth. This is only sped up about three times. Uh, they're moving very fast, living animals. Uh, I'm going to go on and just say one or two more things. Uh, and one of them is, what happens uh, to the former synaptic sites once an axon goes away? Does the axon take over that territory? Does the territory disappear? By making mice where we can cross one blue axon in a sea of yellow axons, we can see neuromuscular junctions that have two different colored axons. And here is, a, for example, a mouse where there's one blue axon and all the other axons are yellow, and then we're looking for junctions that have a yellow and a blue axon, like these three here, to watch synapse elimination. So now we can see the two axons in different colors, and we can watch more detail what actually is happening at the junction. So I'll just show you this picture, and Josh may have shown this as well. This is a picture of a axon, a blue axon that occupies about 70% of the receptors and is kind of thick. And a yellow axon that's thin, has a varicosity, and occupies 30% of the receptors. And then the question is, over time, who is going to win and who is going to lose this neuromuscular junction? So who's going to win? This is postnatal day 11. By postnatal day 14, somebody's going to be gone. Who's going to stay? So that's postnatal day 11. Here's postnatal day 12. Here's postnatal day 13. Here's postnatal day 14. And in case you're thinking it's going to still come back, here's postnatal day 15. <laughs> so this was very interesting. And again, you know, one of the things that came out of this study 
was that very often, not always, about 30% of the time, the input that seemed weaker ended up winning. In other cases, we saw that the two inputs were changing their strength of connections in the midst of this competition going back and forth. And we wondered what could possibly be changing the competitive vigor. This axon looks like it's on, its, on the way out, but clearly it is not on the way out. Uh, so what could have happened? And then we re remembered that each of these axons is participating in many simultaneous competitions like this, because each axon has many other branches. So perhaps this axon that is losing here at this stage has just lost another junction somewhere else. And the cell body, which is transporting material out to the periphery, which used to have to di divide that material among several different branches, now more of it can go to this branch. So more resources are available. Or conversely, maybe this axon has just won another neuromuscular junction, taken it over, so less material goes in here. So maybe the outcome of this competition is in fact somehow weighted by what's happening at all these other competitions at the same time. And this is what turned out to be the case. And in the final uh, just moments, I'm going to just show you that one experiment, which is, uh, shows us that in fact the outcome of these competitions are based on, on many calculuses that are going on simultaneously. And, and the way we figured this out uh, was just by making a mouse where we had two axons labeled, one yellow and one blue. The mouse I've shown you so far was all yellow and one blue, so we could only see one axon's connections in a sea of yellow. But here's a mouse where there's just one yellow and one blue, and we can look at all the junctions shared by these two axons. And this is an interesting experiment because Activity, the electrical pattern of activity, is coming from the cell body. So all of these branches of this yellow axon have the same activity pattern. And similarly, all of these blue axons have a different activity pattern from the yellow, but they all have the same activity patterns. Meaning that this junction, and this junction, and this junction are seeing the same pattern of activity from the yellow and the blue, exactly the same in each case. So one possibility is that the same outcome would obtain in each of these cases. The alternative is that local branches being lost might make the winner here different from the winner down here. So it might be local, or there may be some global property that makes yellow different from blue. So is it going to be global or local? You understand the difference, OK? So which is it going to be? Local? Local? OK, so here's the result. Um, at those junctions. Here is a yellow axon in a muscle. That's all of its branches. Here's the blue axon in a muscle. There's all of its branches. There they are superimposed. And then uh, these over here in the Christmas tree lights blinking are, whoops, are the ones that are shared by the two. And what we're going to ask is at this moment in time, at postnatal day seven, at all these ones that are shared, is the is the winner, or the one that looks like it's winning, the same in each case, or is it different in each case? And if it's different in each case, then one might imagine local effects are playing a role. If it's the same in all those cases, then one would expect global effects. And I just want to tell you one other thing, that the yellow axon has more branches than the muscle as a whole. It has 122 branches, and the, the CFP blue axon has 102. So the yellow has a lot more to do in the muscle as a whole, and, and just keep that tucked in your mind as we look at the results. So I'm going to skip those two slides and just show you those eight junctions. So here in the first one, the yellow occupies a small region of this neuromuscular junction, and in this case is thin and has a little varicosity. I'll show you the next yellow one. Before I show you the blues, I'll just show you the other yellows. Here, again, the yellow is kind of thin and occupies a small region of this neuromuscular junction. Here's the next one. It's thin and occupies a small region there, small region there. It's not this one, it's this one, very small region there. I think you're getting the point here. It's small and occupies a small region there, small region there. And this one maybe looks a little bigger, but quite thin. Now let's look at the blues in each case. Much thicker, occupies the outside, thicker, the outside. And even there, it's the same. Almost all of these look almost identical. And this was kind of puzzling, given what I had just told you about these local effects. 
And the interesting thing is that the axon that had less to do, the one that had fewer branches in the muscle, was in fact winning all these competitions. As if maybe the more dilettantish axon that still was doing too much was being punished and actually being outcompeted by an axon that is focusing on a smaller number of things to do. And what does that mean for the one that had more things to do? It's now lost those branches, maybe meaning at the next set of competitions against some other axon, it'll be more competitive. And that turned out to be uh, the case. So I think I'll end uh, the talk here just to say that these are approaches that can be used uh, to watch events that, you know, I've been studying since I was a graduate student, synaptic rearrangements, uh, only since the new millennium, since jellyfish genes have been possible to put into mice, have most of these things become clear and become clear in a, in a wonderfully easy way. I feel in a way it's much easier to be a scientist now than it was before, although this seems heroic maybe to do life living animal imaging and to put jellyfish genes into mice. Finally, as a scientist, what you want is a tool that gives you answers that you don't really have to fight that hard to get. And uh, these tools remind me of what the Hubble telescope has done for astronomy. They just sort of give you a way to see the world as it is, and then you have to, if you can, eliminate those synapses in your mind that would tend to make you believe other than what your eyes are actually showing you. So I'm happy to take questions. There are any? Yeah? Yes, I was wondering going back to the study of the refraction. Yes. Did, did, were you able to determine that there is a limit to the threshold in each of the processes or particular refractions that you studied? In other words, does it only get to a certain point? Do they always go back to the same point of origin? in every single, or majority of the retractions that you looked at? Um, I'm just trying to think how to say, answer this question. The, the retraction always retracts back to the branch point. Mm -hmm. uh, if both branches lose, then it retracts back to the next branch point. So there's never a stub left behind. At the end of the process, it's clean as a whistle. There are connections and there is nothing left. So in that sense, there's no, it, it, what we saw was that little bit of branch back to the bulb, but if we watched for another few days, we would see the whole thing recapitulate. And if that's the question, basically. There's, there's never anything left behind. Finally, it's all cleaned up, and you'd never know there were all these extra branches there. And you know, you the thing that goes on in the brain as well. Yes, so there's really interesting data just coming out the last couple of years that suggest exactly these things are going on in the brain. Let me give you one example. The connections between the retina and the thalamus, which is the first relay before the eye's information gets to the occipital cortex. It goes to the dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus. Those retinal ganglion cells that send axons to the thalamus in the adult each thalamic neuron is very strongly innervated by a single retinal ganglion cell. So in the adult, you have this powerful one-on-one -on -one connection. A retinal ganglion cell drives a thalamic neuron, and a thalamic neuron then sends its information to the cortex. When people have just recently looked at thalamic neurons at birth in rodents, they find that there are about 30 retinal ganglion cells innervating each thalamic neuron, and then again, over the same period of time, all but one of them leave. So there's one example. In the cerebellum, there is a big cell called the Purkinje cell, and it is driven strongly by one climbing fiber in the adult. In babies, it now looks like there are 40 climbing fibers innervating each Purkinje cell. So those are two regions in the adult, in the brain where it's easy to see. But in both those cases, you end up with one strong input. And most of us think of brain cells as taking lots of diverse inputs and, and integrating that kind of data. And for that, it's much harder to count extra inputs. When you end, end up with one, it's easy to see two or three. But if you end up with 50, if you started out with 100, it's, it's much harder to tell if you lost half of them. So it, it's really only known for a few places. But there's no place where people have said it doesn't occur. But everywhere people have been able to look, it clearly happens. So I think. When I said this thing about, you know, early on we have all these connections, I, I literally mean this. I think the brain is like hyper-wired in a young animal, a young human, and then we just trim away all but a subset. Is, is muscular atrophy in older age attributable to this retraction process? So 
we are, we are just right now writing a paper on what happens in, in, in real aging in muscles. And to our surprise, there are lots of muscle fibers that have no nerve on them anymore. And the fibers get very thin and finally die. Muscle fibers don't like to be uninnervated. They eventually die. So there's a lot of loss of connections with age. Also, however, there are some neurons that have many more connections. So we think what's happening with age is that some neurons are actually dying in the spinal cord and their fibers are either being caused to atrophy and die or other axons branch out to make bigger sets of connections just as they had in babies. They recapitulate those bigger connections because there's not as many neurons out there. So you have both a compensatory reaction of some neurons trying to compensate for the loss of others, but eventually the loss wins out because we see uninnervated neuromuscular junctions with age. I'm curious as to how you relocate that. You don't stop day one, day two, day three. How do you relocate that neuron? Yeah, so you know, a muscle, um, these are mice, so the muscles are not very large and they have a pattern of blood vessels over their surface. And we just draw a little map, just with a pencil on a piece of paper from low power. And then we circle where it is relative to that map of blood vessels. And although it sounds actually quite difficult, uh, it's not that hard. It, it, especially when things are not changing very much, uh, it's, it's really not hard to find the same ones again. Does the glial cell that was uh, part of the axon that atrophy disappearing under the fiber, does it ever find a home? Well, we don't know. Uh, we know it disappears. So we don't know whether it dies or whether it finally finds a place where it touches something and then sort of, it, you know, like a line of people and you have someone buzzing around and it's sort of, you stand next to the line and then suddenly you're in the line. I don't know if you've ever done that. No. <laughs> no, you. <laughs> Well, that's, I think they do that, but I don't know. We, we've never seen it yet, but we're trying to see now whether they die or whether they find a home. Okay, well, you've been a great audience. Thank you.